Welcome to One Off Coder. I'm Dr. G. Vang, and today I want to talk about Goodman Kruskal's Lambda or GKL. Quickly, and we'll go into more details, GKL is able to measure the reduction in predictive error of one variable given another. Although there are equations to describe how to compute GKL, a visual explanation using contingency tables is particularly a good way to conceptually and visually explain GKL. I studied GKL for quite a while because of my fascination with causality. And I'll explain a little bit on how GKL can be used in causal modeling. Let's start to understand GKL by learning about the types of variables it operates on. GKL operates on categorical variables. If you recall, categorical variables are simply variables whose values are finite and have no intrinsic ordering. Let's say we have two categorical variables, A and B. And we want to measure the error in predicting B and the error in predicting B when we know A. GKL is precisely a measure that can compute this quantity. GKL is denoted as lambda of B given A and also lambda of A given B. Typically, measures of association between two variables are symmetric. Take Pearson correlation for example. If we want to know the correlation between A and B, the Pearson correlation of A to B is the same as B to A. For GKL, the association of B and A are about the reduction in predictive error. It is called a proportional reduction in error, or PRE measure. I've already mentioned the reduction in error part, but as you'll see later, the proportional part comes from taking the ratio of error when predicting B and knowing A to just predicting B and knowing B alone. In general, lambda of B given A is not equal to lambda of A given B. There could be cases when they are equal, but not in general. This asymmetric property of GKL is very interesting because it plays into causality. In causality, for any two variables, we may want to understand which is likely to be the cause and which is the effect. According to Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, two Nobel laureates, humans have a cognitive bias in believing that causes are better predictors of effects than vice versa. But this cognitive bias exists only in our mind. In the real world, a cause and effect may be equally predictive of one another, or an effect may be a better predictor of a cause. The amazement is, if humans are so wrong about the physical world around them, we should have not survived. Evolution should have punished us for our incorrect interpretation of the world. Furthermore, Udaya Pearl, a Turing Award recipient, says it is difficult, if not near impossible, to determine causality statistically, and much less based on two variables alone. Pearl, instead, has created a causal calculus using Bayesian belief networks to understand causal relationships. And this causal calculus invariably involves a triplet of variables, three things, not two, when considering causal relationships and inferences. Still, scientific inquiry into the nature of cause and effect relationship continues for looking at two variables alone. Well-controlled synthetic data suggests there is something there to be studied and discovered. These statements are just all a teaser to motivate this talk. GKL is an interesting asymmetric measure of association for two variables. It is one of the few asymmetric measures of associations that I've discovered. If you have others, please let me know. Let's jump into the nitty-gritty of understanding GKL. A good way to study and understand GKL is with simple data. Let's say we have two variables denoted A and B. And let's say they are binary variables, meaning A and B can take on only two values. These two values are on and off. The range of values of A and B is said to be their domains. Now let's say we have somehow captured 1,000 observations of A and B. This table to the right shows a sample of the data that we have captured. I should let you know that this simple example is actually simulated from a Bayesian belief network, where A is the cause and B is the effect. We first draw a value from A, then from B based on the value of A. This setup of the data should be easy enough to get us to understand GKL and how to compute it. So the raw data of A and B can be summarized into counts using contingency tables. A contingency table is simply a summary of how many times combinations of values occurred. I show two contingency tables here, but they are really just one and the same. The difference with these two contingency tables is that they are transposes of one another. In the table on the left, A is in the row and B is in the column. In the table on the right, B is in the row and A is in the column. These contingency tables are said to be two by two since there are two columns and two rows. You'll notice that the number of columns and rows correspond to the number of values for A and B. 
Very important in a contingency table are the marginals. The marginals are not part of the contingency table, but rather derived by summing down the columns or across the rows. The marginals are also counts, but they summarize the counts for each row and for each column. The numbers in the green boxes are the column marginals. The numbers in the orange rows are the row marginals. Don't freak out on this slide. This slide is just showing how to compute GKL for when A is in the row or when B is in the row. The left shows when A is in the row, meaning the computation of GKL of B given A. The right shows when B is in the row, meaning the computation of GKL of A given B. Let me say it differently. The left side is the equation for computing lambda when A is the predictor. The right side is the equation for computing lambda when B is the predictor. Let's just focus on the left side. GKL of B given A is defined as P of E minus P of E given A over P of E. What is P of E? P of E is the probability of the predictive error of B. When we know nothing about A, and the only thing we know is B, for example, its probability mass function, P of E is the error of predicting B. What is P of E given A? P of E given A is the probability of the predictive error of B given that we know A. You can see that there is a ratio here. There is a numerator, which is the difference in the probability of errors with and without knowledge of A. There is also a denominator, which is just the probability of error without knowledge of A. The maximum value of lambda is when P of A given A is zero, meaning if we use the information we have about A to predict B, all predictive errors about B go away. In that case, the numerator becomes P of E, and P of E over P of E is simply one. The minimum value of lambda is when P of E given A is the same as P of E, meaning if we use the information we have about A to predict B, no predictive error goes away. In this case, then, lambda is zero. Let's take a look at how we can compute P of E and P of E given A. I'm going to try to simply state what P of E is. P of E is one minus the maximum of the column marginals over the total number of observations. Let's break down the fraction part. In the numerator, the expression says to go find the largest column marginal and let that be the numerator. The n plus c denotes all rows for a column c. In the denominator, n plus plus denotes summing across all cells or all combinations of rows and columns, which gives us the total number of observations. Look at the green box at the bottom. We have two column marginals. 300 is the total count of when B is off. 700 is the total count of when B is on. If I knew nothing about A, and I just wanted to predict the value of B, I should choose the value of B with the largest frequency, in this case, on. B is off 30% and is on 70%, so to maximize the prediction about B, always choose B to be on, and we should expect to be right 70%. Conversely, we should expect to be wrong 30%, which is P of E. P of E is the probability of the predictive error of B when we do not use information based on A. P of E given A is nearly identical to P of E. The numerator in the fraction part is the only difference. What is the numerator telling us to do? The expression in the numerator says to go through each row and find the largest value in the column, then take all those largest values per row and add them together. That becomes the numerator. Conceptually, when we go through each row, we are using information about A to predict B. Let's look at the first row when A is off. In this row, B is off 118 times and on 72 times. So when A is off, we should always predict B to be off. Let's take a look at the second row when A is on. In this row, B is off 182 times and on 628 times. So when A is on, we should always predict B to be on. P of E given A gives us a probability of error in predicting B when we use information about A. The ratio of the sum of the largest column values per row to the total number of observations gives us the probability of correctly predicting B based on A. 1 minus this ratio gives us the probability of error in predicting B when we use information based on A. Easy, right? You might have to rewind this part and play it over a bit. 
Now that we know what lambda is, how to compute p of e and p of e given a, let's actually do it. Here I'm trying to compute lambda of b given a, or how much reduction in probability of predictive error of b I can expect given knowledge of a. p of e is simple. The maximum column marginal is 700. 1 minus 700 over 1000 is 0.3, or 30%. p of e given a requires to go slow. When a is off, the largest column value corresponding to that row in the contingency table is 118. When A is on, the largest column value corresponding to that row in the contingency table is 628. 118 plus 628 is 746. 1 minus 746 over 1000 is 0.25 or 25%. Lambda of B given A is simple to compute. Just plug in P of E and P of E given A, the result is 0.17. The interpretation is, we can reduce the probability of predictive error in B given knowledge of A by 17%. I won't bore you here, but in this slide, I show the mechanics of computing lambda of A given B. This time, B is in the row, or we are using knowledge of B to predict A. The contingency table is simply transposed, but the formulas work the same way. The result is that lambda of A given B is 0%. Meaning, given knowledge of B, we can expect 0% reduction in the probability of predictive error of A. Remember, I simulated the data from a Bayesian belief network where A is the cause and B is the effect. I sample a value for A first, then based on that value, I sample a value from B. Of course, knowing A would help us predict B, and not necessarily vice versa. You don't have to compute GKL by hand, although I would encourage you to, to see the mechanics of doing so. We've got a Python module called PyPair, which you may use to do the heavy lifting. PyPair is open source, and it can do more than compute GKL for two categorical variables. This module can compute association measures for categorical, continuous, and mixed variable types. There's about 140 plus different association measures baked in. The module plays nice with scikit-learn and Apache Spark. You can get the documentation from Read the Docs, the source code from GitHub, and install the package from PyPy. Here I'm creating a Bayesian belief network using PyBBN. Note how A is the cause and B is the effect. I sampled the values of A and B using logic sampling. The inner workings of sampling is not difficult, but I won't go into details here. I'm just showing you how the sampling of data was done. Note how I put the sample data into a pandas data frame. Lastly, I show the code to compute GKL using PyPair. First, I create a categorical table from the X and Y fields of the data frame. Then, I simply access the GKL property to get the value. By default, the first value will be the predictor, in this case x. So accessing GKL lambda will give us the lambda of b given a. I can compute the reverse GKL by accessing GKL lambda reverse, which gives us the lambda of a given b. The lambda values do not match identically with the examples thus far because of precision and also because all cell counts have one added to avoid division by zero errors. Thanks for watching. I hope you had fun understanding Goodman Kruskal's Lambda and learned a little bit about a new Python module. If you want to get specialized training in statistics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or data science, please visit our website at https If you need the code to see the worked out examples, please feel free to contact us as well. 